Section 24 of Further Chronicles of Avonlea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Further Chronicles of Avonlea by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 12 In Her Selfless Mood, Part 2. When three more years had passed, Christopher began to court Victoria Pye. The affair went on for some time before either Eunice or the Hollands got wind of it. When they did, there was an explosion. Between the Hollands and the Pies, root and branch, existed a feud that dated back for three generations. That the original cause of the quarrel was totally forgotten did not matter. It was a matter of family pride that a Holland should have no dealings with a Pie. When Christopher flew so openly in the face of this cherished hatred, there could be nothing less than consternation. Charles Holland broke through his determination to have nothing to do with Christopher to remonstrate. Carolyn went to Eunice in as much of a splutter as if Christopher had been her own brother. Eunice did not care a row of pins for the Holland Pie feud. Victoria was to her what any other girl, upon whom Christopher cast eyes of love, would have been a supplanter. For the first time in her life she was torn with passionate jealousy. Existence became a nightmare to her. Urged on by Carolyn and her own pain, she ventured to remonstrate with Christopher also. She had expected a burst of rage, but he was surprisingly good-natured. He seemed even amused. "'What have you got against Victoria?' he asked tolerantly. Eunice had no answer ready. It was true that nothing could be said against the girl. She felt hopeless and baffled. Christopher laughed at her silence. "'I guess you're a little jealous,' he said. "'You must have expected I would get married some time. This house is big enough for us all. You'd better look at the matter sensibly, Eunice. Don't let Charles and Carolyn put nonsense into your head. A man must marry to please himself.' Christopher was out late that night. Eunice waited up for him, as she always did. It was a chilly spring evening, reminding her of the night her mother had died. The kitchen was in spotless order, and she sat down on a stiff-backed chair by the window to wait for her brother. She did not want a light. The moonlight fell in with faint illumination. Outside the wind was blowing over a bed of new-sprung mint in the garden, and it was suggestively fragrant. It was a very old-fashioned garden, full of perennials Naomi Holland had planted long ago. Eunice always kept it primly neat. She had been working in it that day, and felt tired. She was all alone in the house, and the loneliness filled her with a faint dread. She had tried all that day to reconcile herself to Christopher's marriage, and had partially succeeded. She told herself that she could still watch over him and care for his comfort. She would even try to love Victoria. After all, it might be pleasant to have another woman in the house. So sitting there, she fed her hungry soul with these husks of comfort. When she heard Christopher's step, she moved about quickly to get a light. He frowned when he saw her. He had always resented her sitting up for him. He sat down by the stove and took off his boots, while Eunice got a lunch for him. After he had eaten it in silence, he made no move to go to bed. A chill, premonitory fear crept over Eunice. It did not surprise her at all when Christopher finally said, abruptly, Eunice, I've got a notion to get married this spring. Eunice clasped her hands together under the table. It was what she had been expecting. She said so in a monotonous voice. We must make some arrangement for, for you, Eunice, Christopher went on in a hurried, hesitant way, keeping his eyes riveted doggedly on his plate. Victoria doesn't exactly like... Well, she thinks it's better for young married folks to begin life by themselves, and I guess she's about right. You wouldn't find it comfortable, anyhow, having to step back to second place after being mistress here so long. Eunice tried to speak, but only an indistinct murmur came from her bloodless lips. The sound made Christopher look up. Something in her face irritated him. He pushed back his chair impatiently. Now, Eunice, don't go taking on. It won't be any use. Look at this business in a sensible way. I'm fond of you and all that, but a man is bound to consider his wife first. I'll provide for you comfortably. Do you mean to say that your wife is going to turn me out? Eunice gasped, rather than spoke the words. Christopher drew his reddish brows together. 
I just mean that Victoria says she won't marry me if she has to live with you. She's afraid of you. I told her you wouldn't interfere with her, but she wasn't satisfied. It's your own fault, Eunice. You've always been so queer and close that people think you're an awful crank. Victoria's young and lively, and you and she wouldn't get on at all. There isn't any question of turning you out. I'll build a little house for you somewhere, and you'll be a great deal better off there than you would be here. So don't make a fuss. Eunice did not look as if she were going to make a fuss. She sat as if turned to stone, her hands lying palm upward in her lap. Christopher got up, hugely relieved that the dreaded explanation was over. "'Guess I'll go to bed. You'd better have gone long ago. It's all nonsense, this waiting up for me.' When he had gone, Eunice drew a long, sobbing breath and looked about her like a dazed soul. All the sorrow of her life was as nothing to the desolation that assailed her now. She rose, and, with uncertain footsteps, passed out through the hall and into the room where her mother died. She had always kept it locked and undisturbed. It was arranged, just as Naomi Holland had left it. Eunice tottered to the bed and sat down on it. She recalled the promise she had made to her mother in that very room. Was the power to keep it to be wrested from her? Was she to be driven from her home and parted from the only creature she had on earth to love? And would Christopher allow it, after all her sacrifices for him? Ay, that he would. He cared more for that black-eyed, waxen-faced girl at the old pie place than for his own kin. Eunice put her hands over her dry, burning eyes and groaned aloud. Carolyn Holland had her hour of triumph over Eunice when she heard it all. To one of her nature there was no pleasure so sweet as that of saying, I told you so. Having said it, however, she offered Eunice a home. Electa Holland was dead, and Eunice might fill her place very acceptably if she would. "'You can't go off and live by yourself,' Caroline had told her. "'It's all nonsense to talk of such a thing. We will give you a home if Christopher is going to turn you out. You were always a fool, Eunice, to pet and pamper him as you've done. This is the thanks you get for it, turned out like a dog for his fine wife's whim. I only wish your mother was alive.' It was probably the first time Carolyn had ever wished this. She had flown at Christopher like a fury about the matter, and had been rudely insulted for her pains. Christopher had told her to mind her own business. When Carolyn cooled down, she made some arrangements with him, to all of which Eunice listlessly assented. She did not care what became of her. When Christopher Holland brought Victoria as mistress to the house where his mother had toiled and suffered, and ruled with her rod of iron, Eunice was gone. In Charles Holland's household she took Electa's place, an unpaid upper servant. Charles and Carolyn were kind enough to her, and there was plenty to do. For five years her dull, colorless life went on, during which time she never crossed the threshold of the house where Victoria Holland ruled, with a sway as absolute as Naomi's had been. Carolyn's curiosity led her, after her first anger had cooled, to make occasional calls, the observations of which she faithfully reported to Eunice. The latter never betrayed any interest in them, save once. This was when Carolyn came home, full of the news that Victoria had had the room where Naomi died opened up, and showily furnished as a parlor. Then Eunice's sallow face crimsoned, and her eyes flashed over the desecration but no word of comment or complaint ever crossed her lips. She knew, as everyone else knew, that the glamour soon went from Christopher Holland's married life. The marriage proved an unhappy one. Not unnaturally, although unjustly, Eunice blamed Victoria for this, and hated her more than ever for it. Christopher seldom came to Charles's house. Possibly he felt ashamed. He had grown into a morose, silent man, at home and abroad, it was said that he had gone back to his old drinking habits. One fall, Victoria Holland went to town to visit her married sister. She took their only child with her. In her absence, Christopher kept house for himself. It was a fall long remembered in Avonlea. With the dropping of the leaves and the shortening of the dreary days, the shadow of a fear fell over the land. Charles Holland brought the fateful news home one night. There's smallpox in Charlottetown, five or six cases, came in one of the vessels. There was a concert, and a sailor from one of the ships was there, and took sick the next day. This was alarming enough, 
Charlottetown was not so very far away, and considerable traffic went on between it and the North Shore districts. When Carolyn recounted the concert story to Christopher the next morning, his ruddy face turned quite pale. He opened his lips as if to speak, then closed them again. They were sitting in the kitchen. Carolyn had run over to return some tea she had borrowed, and incidentally to see what she could of Victoria's housekeeping in her absence. Her eyes had been busy while her tongue ran on, so she did not notice the man's pallor and silence. "'How long does it take for smallpox to develop after one has been exposed to it?' he asked abruptly, when Carolyn rose to go. Ten to fourteen days, I calculate,' was her answer. "'I must see about having the girls vaccinated right off. It'll likely spread. When do you expect Victoria home?' "'When she's ready to come, whenever that will be,' was the gruff response. A week later, Carolyn said to Eunice, "'Whatever's got Christopher? He hasn't been out anywhere for ages. Just hangs round home the whole time. It's something new for him. I suppose the place is so quiet, now Madame Victoria's away, that he can find some rest for his soul. I believe I'll run over after milking and see how he's getting on. You might as well come, too, Eunice. Eunice shook her head. She had all her mother's obstinacy, and darkened Victoria's door she would not. She went on patiently darning socks, sitting at the west window, which was her favorite position, perhaps because she could look from it across the sloping field and past the crescent curve of maple grove to her lost home. After milking, Carolyn threw a shawl over her head and ran across the field. The house looked lonely and deserted. As she fumbled at the latch of the gate, the kitchen door opened, and Christopher Holland appeared on the threshold. "'Don't come any farther,' he called. Carolyn fell back in blank astonishment. Was this some more of Victoria's work? I ain't an agent for the smallpox, she called back viciously. Christopher did not heed her. Will you go home and ask Uncle if he'll go or send for Dr. Spencer? He's the smallpox doctor. I'm sick. Carolyn felt a thrill of dismay and fear. She faltered a few steps backward. Sick? What's the matter with you? I was in Charlottetown that night and went to the concert. That sailor sat right beside me. I thought at the time he looked sick. It was just twelve days ago. I felt bad all day yesterday and today. Send for the doctor. Don't come near the house or let anyone else come near. He went in and shut the door. Carolyn stood for a few moments in an almost ludicrous panic. Then she turned and ran as if for her life across the field. Eunice saw her coming and met her at the door. Mercy on us, gasped Carolyn. Christopher's sick and he thinks he's got the smallpox. Where's Charles? Eunice tottered back against the door. Her hand went up to her side in a way that had been getting very common with her of late. Even in the midst of her excitement, Carolyn noticed it. Eunice, what makes you do that every time anything startles you? Is it anything about your heart? I don't know. A little pain. It's gone now. Did you say that Christopher has th the smallpox? Well, he says so himself, and it's more than likely, considering the circumstances. I declare I never got such a turn in my life. It's a dreadful thing. I must find Charles at once. There will be a hundred things to do. Eunice hardly heard her. Her mind was centered upon one idea. Christopher was ill, alone. She must go to him. It did not matter what his disease was. When Carolyn came in from her breathless expedition to the barn, she found Eunice standing by the table, with her hat and shawl on, tying up a parcel. "'Eunice, where on earth are you going?' "'Over home,' said Eunice. "'If Christopher is going to be ill, he must be nursed, and I'm the one to do it. He ought to be seen to right away.' "'Eunice Carr, have you gone clean out of your senses? It's the smallpox, the smallpox. If he's got it, he'll have to be taken to the smallpox hospital in town. You shan't stir a step to go to that house. I will.' Eunice faced her excited aunt quietly. The odd resemblance to her mother, which only came out in moments of great tension, was plainly visible. He shan't go to the hospital. They never get proper attention there. You needn't try to stop me. It won't put you or your family in any danger. Carolyn fell helplessly into a chair. She felt that it would be of no use to argue with a woman so determined. She wished Charles was there. But Charles had already gone, post-haste, for the doctor. 
With a firm step, Eunice went across the field footpath she had not trodden for so long. She felt no fear, rather a sort of elation. Christopher needed her once more. The interloper who had come between them was not there. As she walked through the frosty twilight, she thought of the promise made to Naomi Holland years ago. Christopher saw her coming and waved her back. "'Don't come any nearer, Eunice. Didn't Carolyn tell you? I'm taking smallpox.' Eunice did not pause. She went boldly through the yard and up the porch steps. He retreated before her and held the door. "'Eunice, you're crazy, girl. Go home before it's too late.' Eunice pushed open the door resolutely and went in. "'It's too late now. I'm here, and I mean to stay and nurse you if it's the smallpox you've got. Maybe it's not. Just now, when a person has a finger ache, he thinks it's smallpox. Anyhow, whatever it is, you ought to be in bed and looked after.' you'll catch cold. Let me get a light and have a look at you. Christopher had sunk into a chair. His natural selfishness reasserted itself, and he made no further effort to dissuade Eunice. She got a lamp and set it on the table by him, while she scrutinized his face closely. You look feverish. What do you feel like? When did you take sick? Yesterday afternoon. I have chills and hot spells and pains in my back. Eunice, do you think it's really smallpox, and will I die? He caught her hands and looked imploringly up at her as a child might have done. Eunice felt a wave of love and tenderness sweep warmly over her starved heart. Don't worry. Lots of people recover from smallpox if they're properly nursed, and you'll be that for I'll see to it. Charles has gone for the doctor, and we'll know when he comes. You must go straight to bed. She took off her hat and shawl and hung them up. She felt as much at home as if she had never been away. She had got back to her kingdom, and there was none to dispute it with her. When Dr. Spencer and old Giles Blewett, who had had smallpox in his youth, came two hours later, they found Eunice in serene charge. The house was in order and reeking of disinfectants. Victoria's fine furniture and fixings were being bundled out of the parlor. There was no bedroom downstairs, and if Christopher was going to be ill, he must be installed there. The doctor looked grave. "'I don't like it,' he said, "'but I'm not quite sure yet. If it is smallpox, the eruptions will probably be out by morning. I must admit he has most of the symptoms. Will you have him taken to the hospital?' "'No,' said Eunice decisively. "'I'll nurse him myself. I'm not afraid, and I'm well and strong.' "'Very well.' "'You've been vaccinated lately?' "'Yes.' "'Well, nothing more can be done at present. "'You may as well lie down for a while and save your strength.' "'But Eunice could not do that. "'There was too much to attend to. "'She went out to the hall and threw up the window. "'Down below, at a safe distance, Charles Holland was waiting. "'The cold wind blew up to Eunice the odor of the disinfectants "'with which he had steeped himself. "'What does the doctor say?' he shouted. He thinks it's the smallpox. Have you sent word to Victoria? Yes. Jim Blewett drove into town and told her. She'll stay with her sister till it is over. Of course it's the best thing for her to do. She's terribly frightened. Eunice's lip curled contemptuously. To her, a wife who could desert her husband, no matter what disease he had, was an incomprehensible creature. But it was better so. She would have Christopher all to herself. The night was long and wearisome, but the morning came all too soon for the dread certainty it brought. The doctor pronounced the case smallpox. Eunice had hoped against hope, but now, knowing the worst, she was very calm and resolute. By noon the fateful yellow flag was flying over the house, and all arrangements had been made. Carolyn was to do the necessary cooking, and Charles was to bring the food and leave it in the yard. Old Giles Blewett was to come every day and attend to the stock, as well as help Eunice with the sick man, and the long, hard fight with death began. It was a hard fight, indeed. Christopher Holland, in the clutches of the loathsome disease, was an object from which his nearest and dearest might have been pardoned for shrinking. But Eunice never faltered. She never left her post. Sometimes she dozed in a chair by the bed, but she never lay down. Her endurance was something wonderful, her patience and tenderness almost superhuman. To and fro she went, in noiseless ministry, as the long, dreadful days wore away, with a quiet smile on her lips, 
and in her dark, sorrowful eyes the rapt look of a pictured saint in some dim cathedral niche. For her there was no world outside the bare room where lay the repulsive object she loved. One day the doctor looked very grave. He had grown well hardened to pitiful scenes in his lifetime, but he shrunk from telling Eunice that her brother could not live. He had never seen such devotion as hers. It seemed brutal to tell her that it had all been in vain. But Eunice had seen it for herself. She took it very calmly, the doctor thought, and she had her reward at last, such as it was. She thought it amply sufficient. One night Christopher Holland opened his swollen eyes as she bent over him. They were alone in the old house. It was raining outside, and the drops rattled noisily on the panes. Christopher smiled at his sister with parched lips and put out a feeble hand toward her. Eunice, he said faintly, you've been the best sister ever a man had. I haven't treated you right, but you've stood by me to the last. Tell Victoria, tell her to be good to you. His voice died away into an inarticulate murmur. Eunice Carr was alone with her dead. They buried Christopher Holland in haste and privacy the next day. The doctor disinfected the house, and Eunice was to stay there alone until it might be safe to make other arrangements. She had not shed a tear. The doctor thought she was a rather odd person, but he had a great admiration for her. He told her she was the best nurse he had ever seen. To Eunice, praise or blame mattered nothing. Something in her life had snapped. Some vital interest had departed. She wondered how she could live through the dreary coming years. Late that night she went into the room where her mother and brother had died. The window was open, and the cold, pure air was grateful to her after the drug-laden atmosphere she had breathed so long. She knelt down by the stripped bed. Mother, she said aloud, I have kept my promise. When she tried to rise long after, she staggered and fell across the bed with her hand pressed on her heart. Old Giles Blewett found her there in the morning. There was a smile on her face. End of section 24